It's April 13, 2000. The location is the First Baptist Church of Mims in Mims. The following is a group interview with P.W. Roberts, Joe Reichert, Ralph Sharp, and Sammy Hendricks. The interviewer is Ross Foster. The cameraman is Laritz Karoff. Um, I'd like to introduce the uh, gentleman that we're going to be interviewing today. Uh, from left to right is uh, P.W. Roberts, um, Mr. J.C. Uh, Ricard, Reichert, Reichert uh, known as Joe, um, Mr. Ralph Sharp, and Mr. Sammy Hendricks. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us today for this interview and uh, April 13th, uh, year 2000, at the um, uh, First Baptist Church of Mims in Mims, Florida. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, to get the uh, folks uh, identified uh, with who you are, uh, PW, why don't you tell me a little bit something about your family's background uh, and uh, how they arrived here in Mims, Florida? <clears throat> Well, my, my grandfather came over from England during the Civil War, and he was a, he was a sailor for the Union Arm, the Navy. And he was wounded in a battle, and uh, he was put in a hospital, and whenever he got out, the war was over. And he and three men, other men, came to Florida, came to Jacksonville, and then down the St. John's River, up the St. George River to Lake Harney, and they walked into Mims, and he settled in where I'm living now, and one man went to Titusville and two went to Sebastian. And what year was this? 1874. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started out as a, uh, he was a horticulturist, and he started out in citrus, and he cleaned the land, and. Uh, Back in those days, it was rough, and mosquitoes was bad, and he started doing that. And then several years later, his wife came over, and uh, she had uh, three children. Uh, the oldest was named Mabel, and the other girl was named uh, Lillian, and my dad's name was Phil. And uh, he... Uh, they all just became housewives, and uh, he uh, went into the citrus business, and he uh, uh, cleaned up a lot of grove, had quite a bit of grove himself, and then he uh, started buying and selling fruit, and he made uh, quite a bit of money doing that. He'd ride a horse from Mims to Coco and buy fruit down there, and they'd, he had a little packing house here before the Blue Goose, and they'd har pack this fruit in barrels and send it uh, up north. And then uh, later on, he, he built the Blue Goose packing house, and he went in, there's a 50 50 de deal with American fruit growers, and he owned the packing house until he passed away in 1947, I think. And uh, then I've uh, taken care of the groves and whatnot since then. And uh, I've been a caretaker at one time. I took care of over 3,000 acres of grove. And uh, I had two heart attacks. And I had to cut down on it. And uh, I still do some consulting. But, and I have a 10 acre grove at my home. And, that's, and I have a wife and two children. And I'm and, uh, blessed with that. Now then, what else can I tell you? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, where was the Blue Goose Packing House located here yes, in right Mims? right east of where we are now, right, right next to the railroad track. On 46. Right. And then there was another packing house north of that called, uh, at that time, it was Brockett and Parish. And then it finally, uh, 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 Florida Sister Exchange bought it, and it was the Florida Sister Exchange Packing House until... It went bankrupt a few years back. And then just to the east of here and south was a packing house. They called it the old, uh, it was a nigh house, wasn't it? 
And uh, then they changed it to Trigo, and it lasted just a few years. But uh, in the meantime, there were three packing houses on the uh, main line of the Florida East Coast Railway down on Wiley Ave Avenue. One of them was uh, Twilliger, uh, who had a lot of groves, and uh, one was uh, Acme, owned by uh, John Dalbor and from Coco, and one by uh, Chase, who was from Sanford. And uh, Twilliger put in a, a juice plant and run it for several years, and then it burnt down for some unknown reason. Uh, and Twilliger, he was one of the old timers here, and he would, uh, he had a wharf out in the Indian <coughs> River, and he'd pack the fruit, put it in barrels, and track, take it out to on that uh, wharf to uh, a loading place for the river boats, and they'd load it on the river boats and take it to uh, uh, New York, which took several weeks. So you know what kind of condition most of it got there in. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to stop there and let we'll, we'll come back in. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Joe, um, tell us a little bit so, uh, something about your family and when they arrived here in Mims area. My father, he came from Leesville, Batesburg, South Carolina, and my mother came from Collins, Georgia. Now, I say Collins, Georgia, and Leesville, Batesburg, but it was back out in the country, and they farmed. And the conditions of the farming were so that most of the, the kids had to leave. Uh, all of them had to leave the farm and find work. So they came to Florida. And from there, um, my mother and father, mother started working in the packing houses. Uh, processing fruit and uh, packing fruit, putting it up in one and three-fifth bushel wooden cartons or crates. And uh, my father, he uh, started in picking fruit and working in the packing houses also. Uh, well, picking fruit, they had uh, moved down with no place to stay, uh, that is, my father would tell me that they slept in the packing bins in the evenings after they got through packing fr uh, picking fruit. And the next day they'd take their ladders and picking sacks and go climb the trees and pick some more fruit. But uh, as it progressed, my father and mother, uh, I'm, I'm referring to them before they got married. Now, they got married. Um, still working in citrus packing houses. And where the church is located now, that is the First Baptist Church, uh, was a sawmill. And after the deletion of the sawmill, as I understand it, it burnt down. Is that correct? Uh, I, as a kid, uh, would play in the sawdust. But prior to that, naturally, me coming here into this world, uh, my father bought two or three of these old tenant houses that they had for the employees to stay in, to work in the sawmill. And he tore them down, pulled the nails out, and built a home just uh, south of the premises here at the First Baptist Church on Jefferson Street. The home is still there. It's all cypress and put together with three small homes, tenants, homes that were for employees of the sawmill. And I, when I went to school, would come home in the evenings. Uh, you know, a kid would be hungry and they'd come home from school and I'd grab a persimmon or orange and come over here and help my father who was making the uh, boxes with a hatchet and they call a stripper. Now, this stripper is not what you think it is, but it was a um, device or a box with nails that would come down through a channel, and he would take those nails in his left hand and drive them in the box with the hatchet in the right hand 
and I have seen him use the blade of the hatchet to set the nail and then two licks and the nail was driven. Um, it was 12 nails to a side, 12 to a bottom, 12 to the other side. Then that box was uh, labeled on both ends. The labels would designate the fruit. Do you remember variety. some of the labels? The labels, uh, well, it had a big blue goose on it. Blue Goose Derby winner. Right. And in the river. You got it. And that paste that was used was something like an old flour paste that you take flour and make a, good kite a paste. Know. Yeah, you can make good kite paste out of it. newspapers. <laughs> But uh, you get it all over, and it'd be so cold, and then actually when you're uh, packing citrus and that matures in the wintertime, and you get in that cold paste and put those labels on the ends of those boxes, and it was quite an ordeal. Then you had to stamp on the box what the variety was in the box, and uh, the packers would uh, wrap each piece of fruit with a certain label paper. Now this paper was a uh, tissue. A tissue paper that had a fungicide in it which would retard spoilage. But now they have gotten to the point of where they, they put it on as a liquid through waxes and polishes. But at that time it had to be all wrapped. Ever Ever, ever orange or grapefruit in that box had to be a wrap. Then they got so they had a wrap just at the crack and the top layer. And then, uh, and that blue goose at the top, that, that head had to be pointed a certain way. Mm -hmm. Where you could read. And uh, it was, uh, it, and they got about, what, seven, eight cents a box for doing that. Something day. like that. My uh, father got three cents a box for building a box. It was under a contract. How many oranges went into a box? According to the size. It anywhere, varied. Three twenty-four. Anywhere from three twenty-four to uh, one seventy-six. One seventy-six. Well, they've changed that from your day <laughs> to the different day now to one twenty-fives. Uh, now this is based on a four-fifth bushel box, and it's cardboard. You don't have any more. Very few of the wooden boxes. Uh, the wooden boxes would be known as Bruce box. Yeah. Now these are all four-fifth bushel boxes. There's no one bushel or uh, two and uh, one, one and three-fifths. Three None of those because they're heavy. If you pick up a, a box of fruit, four-fifth bushel box of fruit, say for instance navels, you're looking at 45 pounds mm -hmm. at least. They used to figure a one and three-fifths weigh 90 pounds. Mm -hmm. Well, at uh, leaving that, as far as myself, I went through high school, and a gentleman on the Florida East Coast Railway by the name of E.W. Spires was making comment, which we were very good friends, to my father about the train dispatcher in New Smyrna wanted to have someone interested in learning telegraphy, Morse code. And I, at the time, did not have a, a job. Didn't know what I was going to do when I got out of school. Well, I didn't know I was going to work in citrus. And that was the thing at that time. You know, whatever your father done, that's about what you done. We uh, started a school in New Smyrna of telegraphy with a train dispatcher. There was uh, six months of schooling, which we had Morse code, station accounting, and on-the-job training. And we were guaranteed a job with the Florida East Coast. The train dispatcher was, uh, the chief train dispatcher was, uh, I think it was Elmer Hall. And he said, you have a job when you get out. So we got out of school, we qualified, passed the uh, examinations for the railroad, and I was scared. He says, uh, you can't see this color? I said, no. What's on there? I don't, Nothing. It was a form of red. And that's what you have to see, signals. Well, he gave me a ball of yarn, 
and I went through the yard, separating the yard, and I passed. So that was a big relief. Mm -hmm. And from there, they, you go on the extra board and you work jobs that other people need vacations, uh, relief, uh, sickness. Uh, you did not know where you was going to be from one day to the next unless you were told a week here, two days there. And uh, we went down to Canal Point, Belle Glade, stayed down there, which uh, the men was working those jobs because there was a lot of overtime. And they sent me down there to relieve them of that overtime, and you know what I had is a very hard time. They never gave me any information. I had to do all research, find out the name of uh, packing houses, uh, produce houses. Um, it was very hard. But I just thank the Lord that he came through. And whenever my last day with the Florida East Coast was, January the 23rd at, uh, in 63, they went on a major railway strike. I was a ticket and freight agent at St. Augustine, which was the general officers. And I was proud of my job at the time. And I was also the general chairman of the Order of Railway, railway Telegraphers. I stayed on strike approximately a year and a half. Then I went to the Seaboard Coastline and worked with them for about a year, year and a half, and uh, working many jobs. From one day, I said, well, my wife and kids are at home. I'm going to have to go home and be with them. I can't stay away from home. So I, I turned in my resignation and moved back to MIMS. Went to work in the citrus again and put uh, 23 years in citrus. The Mem Citrus Growers, also Nevins Fruit Company. From there, I've retired and have Mold a wonderful lovers. life. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> well, Ralph, let's talk with you for a while now. When did your family come to the area? I'm going to have to start out easy on you. Uh, all this might be incriminating on me. I'm, I'm not like these fellows. Now, I didn't come lineage. Our folks come over from Germany some way, somehow. They got off of the boat in South Carolina with all Kaiser's money, and I never knew a sharp to have a job up to our time. They walked from Ocala down to Mims, and they stayed in this area from pillar to post, from Salt Lake. My dad fished, and the biggest thing that he'd done to help the people was make moonshine. Everybody was happy, and we all had a good time. We ate a lot and danced a lot. And we helped build this church with some of the money, because it was specified in there when they come out to get the money where it come from. Well, they said we will let Lord worry about that part. Well, we started from there. Mom, she raised five boys and a heap of these boys. We had brothers that wasn't brothers, but you thought as much of them because you saw as much of them. And my dad, he was in the cattle business, the grow business, distillery. And he did he did hire a little work once in a while. When Gothy moved the sawmill in here, he hired us to do the work. So my dad went out there, and this Mr. Tanner, he told him where he wanted to put the mill, and daddy told him, he said, Mr. Tanner's in the water. He says, you can't put it there. He says, you put it where I want it. So he did. And when he started it up, it looked like a windmill. It was pumping <laughs> the water more than d cutting lumber. So he got rid of that. We moved up on the hill. So there was a big old pine tree there. And nothing to do with that old man but us dig that pine tree up, set that mill right where he wanted it. And Daddy told him, he said, well, he says, Mr. Tanner says, you go ahead and dig it up. He says, you boys load the tools and let's go home. We don't have to work for these people. So that's where it come in that you have money, so you do what you like and want to. Well, he he uh, had a fish business with his brothers, and they loaded fish at Salt Lake and uh, carried it to Titusville on the tram across. He got the job of carrying it on the tram because he was younger, and he, di he didn't have to work. He just led the mule. 
Well, that all went along, and then through the years, uh, we got in the dairy business by the virtue of my brother wanting a blooming dairy. And that, wa that wasn't a mistake. That was just a big job. But then when times got a little rougher, I got out of high school. These boys, I think Pete and them probably already know. Anyway, I went to Jacksonville to school up there. Went to Massive Business College. Sure, man, I couldn't even do nothing. I ended up a barber up in Jacksonville, <laughs> in Barber College. So that that worked out pretty good to come home. Couldn't make a living barber college. I mean, barber and so Jack Williams down there, the finest man ever lived. He, he'd give me half the money, and on some weeks I got it all. But anyway, then I couldn't make that, so I went back dr working with drag line. I started drag line and right out here at this corner in 1936. So I went back to that and we went down to Deerfield, me and brother down there. And we, the war wasn't going too good, so we thought, well, he and I could get in there. We could win that thing, come on home. And that was about, well, I, I was the first soldier and I done was down here on Broad Street, National Guard. Well, Mr. Everett, all these boys knows him as Puss Everett. Well, he couldn't hear it thunder and I was right behind him in line. so. Whenever we'd, they'd give it to the rear march, he was always two, hit, two steps behind or forward. And he'd whop you side the head of that old right. We used old three rifles at that time. So then we went to Deerfield down there. And I joined the Marine Corps down there and brother, we decided we'd get that war over and he joined the Navy. And it didn't quite work that way. He got home. I got home the first month in 46 and he got home about a month, uh, six months ahead of me. But then we started Sharp Brothers Store over here. They'd already started it. They cut it, cut the uh, timber off of our property out there and had Mr. Gothy saw it. So we, Sam, his daddy, he was the head carpenter. That's the reason the roof looks so good. It don't hold water. You wouldn't believe it. It's just all kind of nice humps. <laughs> so when we had to have it done a little more and a little more, but anyway, we finally got rid of the store due to health. And we are still out there raising a few oranges. We can't sell them, but we can raise them. And uh, I don't know of anything else that we did that, that wouldn't incriminate you more. But. Uh, where was the, where was the uh, whiskey still? All over. Oh, well, it depend now. It depend on who was uh, the sheriff. <laughs> where the revenue yeah, were. If Doolittle was in, you could put it on Front Street. <laughs> Bill Williams, you moved it a little further back. And then as time's got a little more there's modern. Still, there's modern. still signs in the woods yeah. out there where they busted up these bottles, yeah. broke up the brick, yeah. where he had these whiskey stills. We knew way ahead of time for this coming, but we had so much stuff to move, you couldn't move it. <laughs> so we just get what you couldn't move it on, but we knew well ahead of time what was coming. Bill Williams come out there one time. They had a deputy sheriff, I don't forgot his name. Ray Love. Ray Love. I guess so. And they come, and daddy went out there and had two colored men that would distill for us all the time. And he said, boys, he said, they were supposed to be here at eight o'clock. Bill Williams says, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so that finished it up. And then after that, it was a federal offense. Before it wasn't nothing to it, you just, everybody, we had several people in the area that made whiskey, but we tried to make a little better and all, so we had no trouble at all selling ours. Bill so. Williams come out there one, I guess it was on a Friday night, and told Chess that the revenuers were in town, they better get his still off of Tyson Ridge. So we went out there and got his still, his buck and everything, brought it home, put the still behind the barn out at Chess's, Ralph's yeah. daddy's and to put the buck in troughs out there for the hogs to eat. Yeah. Little hogs to eat that buck and just fall over drunk. Yeah. Lay there and squeal. Get up and eat some more and fall over drunk. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you, they say when you're hog drunk, that's the way it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ralph, um, tell us about your daddy uh, uh, in boot jacks. What's oh, boot jacks? That was cutting these smaller palm trees. About, they, they like them about 10 foot high cut it off and they uh, cut it down pretty well and they uh, s s trimmed them up nice and they'd call them jacks. They'd be about that high and weigh about a hundred pounds. 
and they'd send them over here to uh, Enterprise. Enterprise. Fiber plant. Yeah, and they'd, they'd boil them real hard and make fiber out of them. They had a machine that shredded them, and they would use it for these brushes, all kind of high price brushes. They were we'd get about twenty cents a piece for them, and pay three cents for picking them. I mean, cutting them, and the government give you all of them you wanted. They didn't care who cut the things or nothing. And when they wasn't doing that, they had a cedar outfit. They cut cedar trees off of government land, which is no tariff on that. Shipped it to Germany. And then there was another item there. They I think the fiber company was called Wooten Fiber Company, wasn't it? Over there Wooten. at Enterprise, Wooten? No, they went by the name of the town over at PW. Do you remember the name of that place? What did she say the name of it was? Wooten. Huh? Wooten. Wooten. I don't remember was a man that was a big shot in it. Ox, ox, ox fiber. Ox, ox fiber. fiber, yeah, ox fiber. Ox fiber. This Wooten was the head man of the club. Well, yeah. Sammy, tell us about your beginnings here in the Mims area. I was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my um, father was a Hendrix in Lexington, South Carolina, about 12 miles west of Columbia, South Carolina. They were out in the farm country. We uh, probably eight or nine miles out of Lexington, and uh, the uh, Hendrixes came from Holland, and they married into the Kaisers from Germany. And back prior to the Civil War, they were great plantation owners. Uh, my ancestors were very wealthy until the Civil War. When the Civil War came along, it broke everything up, and uh, uh, after it was divided after the Civil War, there was very little of it left. They had the old homestead but there's very little of it left. And I remember my great-grandmother, she was in her 90s. I was about 12, 13 years old, and she tried to tell us about the Civil War. Well, my cousin and I, same age, uh, we, too old, too young, frisky, we didn't want to listen. But she would tell about how the uh, Sherman's Army camped there in Lexington while they were trying to take Columbia, and how the Sherman turned the soldiers loose on anything that walked, uh, they raped, and uh, she had some very interesting stories. But anyway, uh, my family tried to farm on up through the the twenties, and boll weevil came in and killed all the cotton. So my dad, we had some of the Kaisers down here: W. B. Kaiser and uh, Pink Kaiser and Jake Kaiser, my great uncles. They had all come down in the, uh, the late teens and. Uh, W. B. Kaiser and Pink Kaiser are the daddies of this church, First Baptist Church of Mims, and along with a few other people. And uh, uh, the bull weevil got the cotton, and we didn't have a, much to do. So my daddy got, I think, six hundred dollars for the uh, twenty-four uh, year, nineteen twenty-four cotton. He bought a Model T Ford, brand new Model T Ford, for around five hundred dollars, and we moved to Florida in, in uh, twenty-five. We left uh, Lexington, uh, I don't remember the days or anything, but it was early one morning. We drove south the first day. We got just a little bit south of Augusta, Georgia. The second day, we got almost to Jacksonville, probably 35, 40 miles north of Jacksonville. We got in on the third day, and uh, my mother's brother and uh, uncles and everything, we stayed with them. My dad uh, had learned the carpenter's trade along with the farming, so he got a, a job with uh, several carpenters here in town. He helped build the old Bayview uh, Hotel and the Riverview Hotel and several other places around here until uh, the burst in 29. I think the way they told me, they had $29 in the bank. They lost that when it folded up. And uh, he went into the, the citrus industry then, but uh, prior to that, there was some uh, old man Sage and somebody else had uh, come down and opened up tomato farm out there to raise tomatoes. And they hired my daddy to come out there and keep up the uh, tractor and the mules, the harnesses on the mules. There's no water or anything. So we lived out there when I was about to, oh, probably four or five years old. I, all I can remember is an old sulfur well out there and uh, uh, a house to live in had two rooms, uh, living room, dining room, sitting room, and one end and bedroom in the other and the outhouse in the back. And, uh, after that, uh, we came into Mims and lived in uh, 
that house there in front of the store that uh, J.T. Sheely has, uh, it's for sale now across from a sharp store. Lived in there a couple of months and uh, several other places. My daddy was uh, working in citrus industry and uh, grove work and things like that uh, after the burst. And uh, Owen Marr came to him one day and wanted him to uh, take a section for him. And the railroad needed a section for him. And my daddy said, no way that uh, section for him was only probably making, I'm just using an arbitrary figure now, probably making a, a dollar a day or something like that, and he can make two dollars a day at the packing house, driving nails like uh, Jake's daddy did, uh, making boxes. Of course, he uh, he uh, nailed up the finished product more than he did, in, did uh, boxes. And after the uh, fruit was packed in boxes, it came to a machine that brought the lid down on each end, and you nailed it and put a strap around it to keep it from coming open. And, truck it out to the railroad there and, and uh, nail it in, stack it in the car, uh, refrigerated cars to go to uh, New York, Chicago, every place else. And, and um, I don't know where we went from there. Ralph and I grew up together. We were more like brothers than we were anything else. When he wasn't staying at my house, I was probably staying at his. And uh, 46 wasn't where it is now. We uh, play football and he didn't play baseball, but I did. But, Coming home after practice, we had to walk out there. There's no traffic. It's a three mile walk. We knew when we got to Mims, called a gas truck or something like that from Titusville to Mims. But we knew here we were going to either spend the night at my house or walk out to his. <laughs> and uh, it, just no traffic out there. And uh, graduated from high school. There wasn't too much going on here. And uh, three of us, not including Ralph, but three of us, uh, Harvey McLemore and, and uh, Homer Johnson, we joined the Navy. We hadn't read the paper much. We didn't know what was going on in Germany in 39 when Hitler was taking over and everything out of that. But we joined the Navy and went through boots up in Norfolk. And I went in the Pacific, stayed out there until 40, 44, I guess it was. Came back, got out in 46. And uh, a doctor friend of mine I worked with for three years there, he tried to send me to medical school. And I didn't want any part of it. Uh, he said, well, I'll pay you all the bills and everything. You can come back and practice with us and go wherever you want to. And I know I, I didn't want to do that. I had an eye on a piece of land over here at Play Linda Beach. I was going over and put in a beer joint and make a fortune. I did, but the fortune hadn't got here yet. I put a little my pump, too. <laughs> <laughs> I put a little concession stand over there with sandwiches and uh, cold drinks and beer, et cetera. And uh, from uh, 47 to 51, I think it was, I sold it for $5,500. The fellow that bought it, he kept it until the government took it over, and he got 55000 for it. So that's the story of that. But uh, I was the only permanent resident that's ever lived at Play Linda Beach. Uh, we didn't have any electricity over there or anything like that. We had our own generator, and uh, we hauled all our water and, and uh, grocers and everything else. But I was the only permanent resident that's ever lived at Play Linda Beach. You remember the little town of Wilson? Yeah, that was far up. That's that that five, six miles west. Yeah. Uh, back at the crossroads, uh, State Road 3. Yeah, and the Wilson School there, we had uh, quite a few square dances there. Yeah, on Saturday night in particular, Tarzan and several more uh, sugar bum playing the guitar and, uh, and the banjo. They'd have a square dance there just about every Saturday night at Wilson. How many people lived in Wilson about? Oh, scattered in the wood around there, uh, considering Wilson, there was probably oh, oh, a dozen families, or and then there was some more south down at the Humpback Bridge, Banana Creek. There's probably a dozen more down that way, and uh, they were big families too. Do you remember what some of their names were? There's uh, uh, Griffiths, Hazelwood, uh, Briggs, Butch, Butch Benicky, Anderson. And I don't know. Um, Staniger's. Staniger's. And uh, Wolf. Widdens. Hey, Widdens. Bucharell. Well, they yeah. didn't live in Canaro. Yeah, that other than, though, they would one of them live right there at the uh, post office. How about Allen Hurst? You remember Allen Hurst yeah, in Clifton? Yeah, that's where my wife was born. Yeah, was She's real? a foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> born over on the island. How about, how about Shiloh? Y'all remember well, Shiloh? Yeah. That was, she was halfway between the, there. There's a high sand hill, and she was born on top of the hill. The city was there and the city there. And she went to school, I think, 
No, she didn't. Her sister went to school. She went to a higher grade of school over in Scottsmore. Uh, can you tell me about Tamerville? <laughs> what was Tamerville? Tamerville or Tamerville? I don't know. Uh, There's just uh, uh, one or two buildings there, mostly kind of a, uh, a big building. Uh, uh, skating rink and uh, a nightclub and whatever where the elite and less elite would uh, have their parties and what have you. Where was it located? It's, uh, on the high, on U.S. number one, about uh, probably a thousand yards south or north of Kelly's Restaurant, where Kelly's Restaurant is now, at the uh, right at the U.S. one and Parish Road, I think they call it. There was a building about the size of the inside of this church, and yeah. they'd have mm -hmm. uh, it used to start it out. They'd have boxing matches on. Uh, on uh, special occasions, and Willie Norwood, who was a boxer, and Red Scrogum, and Paul Puckett, and several others who thought they were boxers, they used to go there and box. And then they turned into a skating rink and a uh, party, and, and it wasn't very long to, well, I guess it stayed there probably 10 or 15 years, and it burnt down. Mysteriously burned down. Yeah. We was there one night, and they had a big bear, real bear. And they uh, they would give anybody five dollars that could drink a coke quicker than that bear. Well, nobody got the five dollars. The bear got the coke, though. <laughs> and it really happened. Uh, yeah. uh, we were discussing where the Indian Mound was earlier. Can you t all tell us about something about the Indian Mound? The one out uh, southwest of Mims. What's the name of that road, uh, J.C., that uh, comes in by Nevin's Packing House going west there? Parish. Parish, Parish Road. Road. From U.S. 1 to uh, uh, Holder Road out by 95, Parish Road goes straight through there. Well, about, oh, probably a quarter, maybe a quarter of a mile east of 95, and uh, a couple hundred yards south of Parish Road, there's a big Indian mound in there. And Brevard County is supposed to be protecting that, but I understand it's being eroded quite a bit but uh, I haven't been in there in about oh probably six years but it was still there about six years ago I reported it to the county some division of the county uh, recreation or department and they said they had it on the map and it was preserved but uh, there's never been anything there's one sign put out there it disappeared probably three or four months after they put it up and uh, uh, they have blocked uh, the county or someone's going in there and blocked the road, just pile sand so you can't drive into it. You have to walk into it now. Uh, I haven't been in there in about six years, but uh, it was in uh, relatively good shape the last time I was in there. It was still about oh, probably 10 or 12 feet above the ground. It used to be probably 20, 25 feet above the ground. When we were kids, we'd go out there and dig in it, and uh, we never found anything but a few old arrowheads, but uh, some of the others are supposedly dug some skulls and things out of there, but uh, we found a few old arrowheads. But there's, when I was in there five or six years ago, there's pine trees probably 12 inches in diameter growing out of the, uh, the Indian Mound. Uh, Sammy, tell us uh, about where the old tram road that came from Salt Lake uh, and something about that. Most of that uh, uh, has disappeared. The only section of it that I know is still visible is right uh, behind uh, Titus Woods or whatever it is, the uh, uh, condo minimums there on uh, Singleton Avenue just south of Derry Road. If you go in that uh, condo minimum, that uh, uh, project, the uh, tram line runs on the southwest property line out into what used to be Horace's pasture. You can see where it goes on through there, but it, uh, unless you're really acquainted with the area, it's hard to explain where it went, but it came, went on kind of a northwest uh, track from there, all probably into what is now, uh, um, what is the name of that subdivision there? Uh, Columbia? Oh. I don't know. And with a subdivision yeah. over there, and it, and it turned west and went into Salt Lake American Landing. Village. American yeah, Village, yeah. yeah. It went into what is now American Village, and it's all been uh, bulldozed down. You could have no idea where it went through there, but. Uh, it meandered kind of uh, back and dodged the, the low places is what it did. It, uh, there's a little old cypress pond here or there that they couldn't get through to go around it. And 
It was a pretty straight shot, though, and went into, uh, uh, some people call it Pace's Landing. Uh, uh, Milton Hickenbottom claims that, that was Pace's Landing, but uh, Pace's Landing is also on the Indian River down here. Uh, he's, uh, Milton says that each end of it was named Pace's Landing. I don't know about that. But it's anyway, this... It's Salt Lake Landing. Yeah, it's always been Salt Lake Landing to us. And on the um, west end of Salt Lake, there was a, a place where the flat bottom boats tied up and an area they could unload there that was high enough ground in, in dry weather they could unload boats onto this tram and brought it in and it went uh, through there on uh, meandered kind of southeast into Titusville and went in on Broad Street and right on out uh, to the, what we call in later years the Gulf Dock and uh, uh, it was uh, pulled by a mule but Jimmy Carlisle, I don't know how much he knew about it. His, his daddy was quite uh, an old timer around here, but he told me in the latter part of the uh, existence of that railroad, they had a little steam engine on it that burned uh, lighter knots. And every uh, uh, mile or so, they had to stop and pick up some lighter knots out of the woods to keep the boiler going. Uh, true or not, I don't know. He's the only one that ever told me that. But, uh, most of the people remembered it as just a, a mule drone. Uh, cart or whatever it was and passengers would come up the St. John's River and uh, take that tram and freight take that tram over to Titusville and continue on south on flat bottom boats but uh, sometime you're out this way I'll take you and show you where the tram is and that piece of property that, that those uh, uh, condominiums are on uh, the southwest uh, border it uh, the southeast and the southwest corners on the uh, the uh, survey and plat it designates as a, a post in the middle of the tram line so it's, it's recorded as a property line um, we're going to talk about some of the other places out there around uh, Salt Lake um, well, going back to Salt Lake uh, mm -hmm. Roz if you stop long enough on a clear day, you can see Salt Lake from Six Mile Creek Bridge out there. Hmm. It's a big lake, lays about uh, oh, probably three miles, two and a half miles across the prairie there. And you can see uh, that's Big Salt Lake, Little Salt Lake, and Aunt Sarah's Pond is to east of there. And then, uh, uh, what is that, Shad Creek goes Shad. through to Luffman Lake? Shad Creek. Shad Creek is as crooked as a snake's crawl, goes through to Luffman Lake. And then uh, Luffman Lake went through uh, Snake Creek and into Ruth, Ruth Lake, Ruth Lake and Clark. Uh, Clark Lake and on into St. John's River. That's where the flat bottom boats came in from uh, up the St. John's River. Jacksonville. From Jacksonville. Um, uh, how about Baxter Point? Ralph, uh, tell us uh, how Baxter Point, what, what is the significance of Baxter Point? Well, I think the biggest significance is where the, all the counties come together right on Baxter Point, where the old Baxter House sit from about, it was about 100 feet south. And there was four counties there, Volusia, Brevard, and Seminole, and what's the other? Orange. 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 And we, we set a monument there about, 40, or just say 1950, we put a permanent marker in there, a good one, and uh, then, they, but the, before then, uh, we fooled with it, there's Baxter people there, they, I don't know where they come from, do you have any idea, P.W.? Yeah. I, all I ever heard was Baxter. So Geneva, they must, Geneva and Sanford area yeah, is all I ever heard. They must have just come up out there, and they had a shack built there, and the all. And it grew from that to a little bit. The uh, old Lady Baxter, I can remember when she died and they brought her in in an old rowboat from out there. I, we thought that was quite a deal, you know, to bring somebody that far in a rowboat. But they were good abiding citizens, though. They, they had a fellow out there that was a little on the mental side. I don't know who he was, but he was giving them some trouble, so they shot him and pushed him down the river in the boat. So. They, <laughs> Then they come out, the law, law finally come out, and then they said, well, we're going to have to convict you. So Ms. Uh, Clark, she was a Clark then, they decided she was the one that killed him, so they, she took the blame. The old lady took the blame, and they turned her daughter loose, so that settled that deal. Yeah, but she shot her brother. Yeah, well, Arnold. Arnold. Carried it. Yeah, I seen him pick the splinters out of his belly. 
<coughs> going back to Mr. Sharp's uh, uh, bootlegging or whatever you want to call it, he had competition out there too. Oh, Carrie yeah. Clark, just before, just just a little bit west of ninety, where ninety five years now. She had her own business right there on 46 going at the same time, but we tried to uh, deter that as much as possible. We told her, told everyone that uh, she uh, uh, colored her whiskey with uh, horse manure. <laughs> How about out at Hat Bill? Mm -hmm. What was Hat Bill in the old days? That was part of the Baxter Point area. Okay. That was really, uh, Preacher Guy had bought an old place there for little to nothing from, I guess it was from Arnold Baxter. And anyway, the then uh, he had a friend, Hat Bill, Hat, Titcomb, Titcomb from, from Maine. England. Uh, yeah, Maine, Maine too. And he come over there and Preacher uh, was pretty smart. He decided he would, and, and let the old man be in and he, he was uh, a good bow and arrow man, so long bow. So they measured off and made him a, a range there. And that's where the Hat Titcomb come in he got him in there so he could get a little money to buy some more cows and let our hogs have something to eat. So that's, that's what the hat tit them. It's H-A-T, and that's where the uh, preacher Kaiser and him concocted. They had another fellow there by the name of Ned Sylvester. He done the house care for them. He was from Maine. It was a little camp, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what we, we built the camp for him. and. Don't remember what year, man, and brother Rufus and John Osmond. We were master carpenters. So. Back in about uh, 35 or 36, somewhere along there. We would build a house there about half as big as this part. <laughs> and it was too slow for us, boy. It just wouldn't go. So we had a handsaw on that old wood was tough. So we got a crosscut saw, nailed them all together. And so when we got down, the further we got down, the longer they got. <laughs> And the other side, the shorter it got. So whenever we put it up there, we figured the preacher got it have a bit. He said, gosh, bum boys, he said, that's all right. We got it all fixed, finished it off, and he said, boys, that's a fine job. He says, but you forgot that we put sliding windows in it. Didn't have no glass. He says, you got to have a, a glass window for Estelle. That was his wife. Okay, so he went somewhere and got a window. So we had to put a handle on this uh, Thing, so you slide it back and forth. So, Matt and John Henry, <coughs> we, we held it up. Rufus drove a nail, and we heard some glass and went by, and he drove the handle and the nail right through the glass on it. So it ended up, and Estelle didn't have no glass, but that, that was the hat bill story right there. I understand Mr. Titcon was an international archer champion. He was, yeah. He'd done a lot of a longbow shooting. He'd shoot the old garfish, and, Occasionally a gator, but the biggest thing was this uh, garfish. The water was shallow and clear along then, and he killed a lot of them. But he, I remember they, they, he could shoot that thing from one end of that doggone range to another, and they had it metered off, and he, he was very good at it. And uh, there was another uh, fellow that used to live out there, old Bert Johnson. Hey, that's Kim to Sam. I'll let him have it. I got, I got a story about Mr. Burt Johnson. Uh -oh. oh, good. <coughs> uh, back when we were very small, young, we go out and we had Skeeters, what we call Skeeter. It would be in a truck, and uh, it was Alfred Carter's. You remember that? It had them wide tires on it that you run the beach with, the airplane tires? Yeah. yeah. Well, we went out camping. And we went out to Hatbill or out there at Baxter Point, and it had rained. And one of those little sloughs had a lot of water in it, and we ran through there and got on the other side and pitched camp. We were going to spend the night right there on the river. We called the Hatbill Park, where Hatbill Park is located right now. Well, mosquitoes got so bad. I mean, we couldn't handle them. We built fire, we got in the smoke, we done everything. Well, I was decided we'd go back up to Hatville, or Mr. Kaiser, W.B. Kaiser's place was, and uh, we'd spend a night in one of those little cabins he had there, it had a screen porch on it. We couldn't go back with the truck, uh, with the Skeeter, because of the marshy, slick area, we'd get stuck. We didn't want to be in that at night, stuck. 
So we walked over to the, which was about, I guess, half a mile from there. Right half a mile. Yeah, to the uh, old cabins they had there at Hatville. And, uh, well, we put our bunks in, uh, well, not bunks, you call them Bed. quilts and blankets and Bed palmetto bed. fans and all that in one of those uh, front porches. And lo and behold, we got all bedded down. This is about 12 o'clock. This fella come out there in the shorts, no shirt, just a raise and say, and we scared us as young boys. They get yourselves out of here. Well, there was four or five of us. So we bundled up. So, well, boys, what are we going to do? We can't stay here in this mosquitoes. They eat us up. So we walked all the way from Hatville to Highway 46 to Ralph Sharp's home. You remember anything about it? You brought us to Mills. And that was quite an ordeal. That fella, he was so arrayed, he, he's giving us all kind of fits going into those little old shanties there with, you know, couldn't even let us spend the night in the camp. Ross, to refresh your memory a little bit now, this is the same Burt Johnson that had the Magnolia Theater in right. Titusville. It was his dad that opened that theater down there. And he lived at South Lake as a young man. He worked at Nevin's Packing House down on the river. He'd come through Tamerville, never slow down for US-1. He'd just yell out, look out, Yankees, here I come. And on <laughs> the wonder he hadn't got killed. But uh, the same family that had the Magnolia Theater in Titusville. He also had Burt Johnson's billiard hall and saloon. Y'all yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. remember that? Had a barber that shop. fine place of barber shop? Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I believe it, he used to be, a, at that time, a, a, a good semi-pro baseball player. At one time, yeah. At one time. And I believe his name was Cockshut. Yeah, right. right. And That's it, right. He changed it to Tom, uh, Burt Johnson. Yeah. He was, he was rough. He was a cattle man. He lay, lived the woods. and. Uh, at one time he made a lot of money and he had a lot of money, but he found that some way he lost it and uh, Miss Bevel wound up with the building and the theater and everything. And I, I Bert died, I guess, out there in the... Out there in that little old camp in front yeah. of Butler's camp. Yeah. A little lean-to he had built there. Looked like where the, the, the rats lived or what have you. How about well, Southmere? Southmere. We're in the same area now. That's where I live right now, right in the middle of town. You South, wouldn't, Southmere was yeah, uh, yeah. formed by a bunch of people from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. and they built uh, uh, a clubhouse, a big clubhouse for that time, and they had a post office, a school, a golf course, telephone, and uh, had orange groves and farmed out there, but they couldn't get water. And so they just finally dwindled off one by one, and uh, to what it, there's more people out there now than it's been in years because they found some way to get water with these osmosis deals. And Ralph he dug a cistern and getting uh, water there out of that. But they, uh, they they tried deep wells and all they could get was salt and sulfur, sulfur. <laughs> and then about 19 and 30-something, early 30s, when was 46 built through there? They put a prison camp out there. Right? That was in the early 30s because uh, uh, they didn't pave it until after I left here in 1940. Well, it and had the, that big the prison. The convicts and everything built it in uh, uh, early to mid-30s. And they used mules and skip, yeah. slip pans, and finally they got rid of the mules and they used wheelbarrows. Mm -hmm. yes. This was when they built Route 46 right. to the, uh, from Mims to the Volusia County time, line. It right. wasn't 46 at that time. It was 44. 44, I think it was. 44, they changed the name. Yeah. They where, didn't move the road. They just moved the name about 30 miles. <laughs> where was the prison camp? But tell us a little bit of something about the prison camp. Well, that let was me out tell there. you about the golf course first, then okay, we get to the prison. Okay, that's fine. Well, they, right in front of where my house is now, which is five miles from Mims on 46, there was a 16-hole golf course there. And they, the first Ford tractor I ever saw was there, an old English maiden. And they had really a nice co course there. 
Well, the last time I seen the course, I was working for the state then. The airplane was forced down. This was right at the very first part of the war, World War II. And it was forced down, and they landed there, and we refueled it. So there's palm, uh, pine trees and everything. You couldn't believe it. There's pine trees 18 inches through now that's in the runways, uh, fairways and all. And then the state come in there, like we was talking then, and moved out there about another two and a half, three miles, three miles from me. In other words, it'd be five plus three, it'd be eight miles from Mims. And on the right there, that's where they, right on the big curve, there's, that's where they put the prison. They brought them people in from... Uh, well, the prison well, camp was right off of 46 where the power line uh, yeah. makes mm -hmm. a turn to the, the right. Road. County road turns north. Uh, County road turns north. It's uh, Prison camp was right there on your left yeah, as you yeah. turn north. It was there for years. I was, what, 10, 10 or 15 oh, yeah. years? Well, a long time. I was at least 10 years. They yeah. brought the prisoners down and the, the people that was uh, from Williston, Florida, wherever that is. And they brought them down and they built a stockade out of two befores. They didn't have no metal naturally. And then they had mules out in big form. And they had a captain, the man's boss man, the big man name was John R. Roberts. And I thought he was about the dressedest man ever built. He had real alligator boots and real nice clothes. Boy, he, but he was a mean man, boy. Hey, if them convicts give them any trouble, they'd tear their britches up with whip a ring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'd whip their britches good. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one time, man and brother come up unexpectedly, and they was on to this fellow about something, and they give him a whack in, and whenever they realized we was there, then they come to told my dad to tell them boys not to remember anything they saw, you know, to keep from stirring it up. But that was how basically how nice and then they had another one there that they couldn't do nothing with, and he run and he got shot, and they buried him in the road out there where he wouldn't be in no trouble. So he still holds up part of 46 out there. He had those black and white stripes on yeah. there. Before that, I don't remember it, but I hear the old timers talking about it. There used to be a turpentine camp here in Mims where uh, the exchange packing house is, and they used prisoners to go out in the woods and do the scraping of the trees and gathering of the gum and whatnot. And they went out uh, through an old trail, which is now 46, as far out as nearer to the river, and they'd trot those men out in the morning and trot them back in the afternoon. And, if, if they, and some of them was, had chains around the ankles, so those, the bad ones, so they couldn't, you know, make big steps. And they had the guards rode horses to keep them in line and they used whips to keep them straight. I believe that was called Kelly's Turpentine? No, 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 no. That, was years before that. that was years that, later. That was way before that. Was it, uh, do you remember the little town that was out there? It was called Cobbs uh, Creek or something like that, Cobbs Creek. Was there a little town out there called Cobbs Creek where the turpentine no, I nice. think you're thinking, Ross, now possibly, I don't know, you're thinking about something up in Volusia County. What's Cal that? Creek. Cow Creek. Cow Creek, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, Cal Creek. Creek. Yeah, that's, that's up in Volusia County. And, uh, Kelly, Kelly moved his. Uh, well, Gothy came here in, in 1937, I think it was, and had that sawmill up at a rancher, and then he moved it down here. And then Kelly built uh, a uh, still, turbine still, right in fr where I live, right where the post office is now. On US 1. Mm -hmm. US 1, right. And he had uh, his his camp for the commissary and the shacks for the men that was out here right back of the road runner on, off of Tomato Farm Road. Okay. Is that why that's called Turpentine Road going off of 46? Yeah, I, I imagine. Is that where the camp was? Yeah, that's where the camp was, but the still was up here and it burnt. Right after I was married, I think it was about 1951 or 52. Uh, let's all talk about something that was really fun for all of you guys, and that is Big Camp. Yeah. PW, yeah. start it. Okay. We had a, we had a chance to, to lease this property out here from 
Norris Cattle Company in 1954, I think it was. And uh, the way we got it, we had a friend by the name of Will Osteen, and we was hunting out there, but we we just didn't have any lease, we just hunted. And one morning, Will Osteen came in and saw me at the store, and he says, if you boys want that property out there, he says, y'all better go to Ocala and lease it. And uh, he says, he called him the man. He says, the man is in the office now because I just talked to him on the radio. So Horace and I got together real quick and we went to Ocala. And we went out to Norris Cattle Company's office. And Mr. Ferguson, G.A. Ferguson was the main man, but the man we talked to was uh, Byron and Johnson. And so uh, we told him what we was wanting to do and how long we'd been living there. And he says, well, he says, uh, I'd like to see you boys get it. He says, uh, how much money do you think you can pay us? There was about 39,000 acres. And, uh, but we didn't want it all, we just wanted what was on the west side of the St. John's River. And uh, I said, I, I really don't know. I don't even know whether we can get anybody to join or not. He says, well, how, how does uh, $900 suit you? I said, well, maybe we can raise that. So uh, we came back home, we got talking around, and there was more men interested in what in boys than what we thought for. So I called him back, I says, uh, can, he said 20 men. I said, we got more people interested than, than 20 people I said, what about letting us have 30? And he said, okay, 30, $1,200. So that's what we did. We kept that uh, from 1954 uh, for $1,200 for oh, six, seven, eight years. And then they finally decided they better have more money. So we, I think it finally went up to about 2500 and then it went on up to when we got, when we lost the lease three or, three or four years ago, we was paying $22,000 for it. Mm -hmm. And we, we had a, a nice camp. It wasn't anything modern, but it was a nice camp and a cook shack and an eating pavilion. And we had a big barn that had take, put eight horses in the saddle room and uh, feed room and places for our dogs and we just had a good time and every Thanksgiving we'd have a, a barbecue and we'd catch the hogs out of the woods and put them in the pen and keep them for several weeks and then we'd barbecue and we've had as high as 140 50 people out there and uh, we just just to get together and just a good time and uh we had that thing for that many years we didn't allow any drinking. We could not have any drinks. Nobody could have alcohol. We, would, <laughs> we wasn't allowed to have litter of the property. And uh, <coughs> so we kept it good and clean. And uh, we've had, we had a big, we had a, a lady from the Orlando, no, the day paper come out and interviewed us and wrote a big article for it. I still got it. And it, it, it's just a place for, for the hunters to uh, get together with the wives and friends and have a good time. Who are some of the uh, old timers that belong to it? Well, right. <laughs> well Ralph, Ralph and I were the, were the youngest ones. No, uh, Sammy's brother. We're the, we were the youngest. And whenever it was over with, he and I was the only one left. But uh, there was uh, Sammy's daddy, Ralph's daddy, Ralph's two brothers, uh, Owen Moore, Billy Moore, Otis Peacock, uh, Floyd Steele, George Ellis. Uh, George Ellis. Huh? George Ellis. Yeah, George Ellis, O.C. Russian. Uh, 
Don't forget old, what's call him out of Merritt Island? Yeah, huh? Lionel, Lionel Ennis. Lionel Ennis. Alfred Carter. Now, Alfred didn't start there. Mm-mm, no. No. There wasn't uh, but a few of us started it. There was 30 of us. Was yeah, Rudolph? I mean, no one. Is Rudolph? Right now. Huh? Was Rudolph? No. And he was? You know, uh uh-uh. We had everything out there but a wedding. We never had a wedding. Well, <laughs> we had a lot of others, and all the years we never had an accident. No, to hurt. we had one accident. One kid got his arm broke. Well, well fell Ra- out of the tree. Francis Bevel, he fell off a stump and had to take in his leg. Yep. Wilson, what was his name? Who? Virgil. Virgil Wilson. He no, was he a, didn't know. He was a cook out there. Yeah, he he was a mess. Virgil Wilson didn't belong. Yeah. I, re- uh, I recall a wonderful person, uh, a lady who belonged to your club, who is very active and a great lady of wonderful substance. Uh, Ralph, I believe you knew her very well. Yeah. What was her name? That was my mother, but it was also a brother to these three and a brother to the no- a mother to no telling how many. And she, she didn't take no stuff. There wasn't no stuff went on. She, uh, in this article, she, uh, she, she uh, stated that, uh, that uh, P.W. was the captain, and she says we did what he, what he asked us to do, and she'd stay on that deer stand. I don't care what kind of weather it was. She'd stay there until somebody come after her, yep. and she wasn't going to go in until it was all over with, and somebody would come in. Before we had CBs, I used to have a cow horn. And I used to blow that cow horn to let everybody know that we're through hunting to come in. And you could hear that on a good day. You could hear that cow horn for a mile or so. And we'd had to give three long blasts, and that meant that the hunt was over, and we'd come into camp. And every, every day at noon, we'd go into camp, and the ladies would fix us a good meal, uh, biscuits and, and vins and, and rice and gravy and whatever. And we had a, we had a good time. How many notches did she have on her shotgun stock? I don't know. She killed probably seven, eight, yeah. ten deer. Her name was Carmen Sharp. Carmen, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Carmen. They, she, they took a picture of her, and then I was thinking of this young fellow here. They they took a picture of him, of her with her gun, but they drew it out the barrel like this young fellow I got here. If you want to see it. <laughs> and it looked like uh, two barrels with Point a stock right on it. <laughs> She had a 20 gauge shotgun. Yeah. Yeah. She could hunt. Gun. She could hunt just as good as you fellas, can't you? <laughs> yeah, she she, loved well, she her was dogs. tough. She loved her dog. She loved to hunt. She loved to cook. Yeah, yeah, she, she loved to good, cook. Good. Yeah, good doctor. One of the boys, we none was here then. The rattlesnake bit this boy during the war, and they brought him there to the house, and she so she proceeded to cut him with the butcher knife and bleed him to probably half to death. And Wallace Fagan, his son, daddy, Junior. yeah, he still says, or he's dead now, but Who he said it? she saved his life, Junior. said that that or saved Wallace the kid's Fagan life. But where she'd cut it, I was figured she'd not be in here. I figured she'd have a lot of infection and everything, but evidently the bacon wasn't polluted or nothing, so she just used the butcher knife. She so, used, used all natural medicines, too, and... Yeah. I was out there playing one day, and uh, there's a burner on an old kerosene stove about so long they set it over the, the, the flame so that all the heat would come up to the pot or whatever it was. It was laying there on the uh, ground, so I just barefooted. I just hauled off and jumped on it. It cut a slice in my instep there about uh, two and a half inches long, almost to the bone. Carmen went over there and up under the porch, she got a, a big handful of cobwebs and put it in there and stopped the bleeding. I understand that was common to stop bleeding in those days, yeah. to yeah. use cobwebs. Yeah. Well, we yeah. always called her Grandma Sharp. <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, Ralph was growing up, Chess was a, was a trapper. He liked, loved to trap, and that's where he made a lot of his money to, to live. And he found, uh, he, he killed, I guess, a uh, the mother to two small otters. They were little bitty yeah, things. About as big as your fist. And they raised those otters, and those things would go in that house and around just like a dog. Mm-hmm. And they, they, how long? She had them how long? Oh, gosh, it's ten years. years in yeah. yeah, at least, because we took them to Kissimmee and the old Model D Ford, how gentle they were. And they got out, and the keeper 
come down there and said that there were some otters out. They assumed they were theirs, but they were ours. So Mom, she called the things, and they'd gotten the gator pen, so he got a pretty good knock on his head, but we got them, put them back in the car. But that's how, as B. David said, how tame they were. They'd get on Mom's white sheets and put his hind legs straight out, and he'd kick, and he'd make it look like a black streak on a white house. <laughs> She walloped the fire out of them, too. Ralph's, <laughs> Ralph's grandparents on his mother's side, the uh, Hickenbottoms, lived down in Kenansville. And uh, I have never known, except this one time, for Chess and Carmen and his family to take a vacation. I don't know whether it was a vacation or a business trip. It might have been a business trip. But anyway, they went down to Kenansville for a week to uh, stay with Carmen's people. My mother and dad went out and ran the business, what have you, while Chess and Carmen were gone. And this fellow by the name of Phil Hunt, he had the Chevrolet place in Titusville. He was one of Chess's regular customers, and he came out there that Saturday afternoon, and I wanted to go horse ride, and Daddy didn't have time for me. He's gone somewhere, so uh, Phil Hunt, he saddled a horse for me, old Cora. We took off down, well, the 46 was just filled then, and uh, it turned up there in front of Ed Sharps and went north. So I got a pretty good lope out of the uh, mayor until she got to the corner up there and we turned north. And I started uh, putting a little paddle to her and kicking her in the side to get the reel running real good. Well, she did. She took off out across the prairie there, decided she was going home, and she whipped around to go back home. And me in the saddle, we just went right straight on out. <laughs> About a mile and a half, I had to tote that saddle back to the house and <laughs> drag it. And when we were kids, we used to go to Titusville on Saturday night to see the movie. And after the movie was over, we'd walk the streets. Yeah. And Ralph's mother and daddy, they had a Model T touring car, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And there was th those two and five boys. And when it wound up to get home, there was about eight or nine or ten of us in that bottle T Ford, that's the only way we could get home. So they'd always bring us home because so, we didn't have any cars. And he, they had that Model T, so that's the way we got our way home. And I, I bought a many a night home from a, from a show on US 1 and never see a car. I'll tell you another little story that's not very clean. But Ralph and I had never ridden I a train. I just shut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> Ralph and I had never ridden a train. The old buck, the branch line here, it went north in the morning, came south in the afternoon, and carried a, a passenger car. But you could ride to get a ticket. There was a ticket agent over here in Mims. You could get a ticket to Tysonville for a quarter. Well, Ralph and I a saved. Nickel boy, you wrong. Was it? Anyway, we saved up our money and got a ticket to go to Titusville. Well, the conductor was out with the uh, engineer switching around and everything. We'd never been on a train. So uh, we got in and looking and inspecting everything and had a restroom on each end. Ralph used one, I used the other one. We flushed it right there in front of the station. You talk about a conductor getting mad. He called us everything but white boys. And don't you, he locked them up after that. Don't you ever do that. We don't flush toilets in front of a train uh, station. Don't you know that? I mean, he, he really chewed us out. We didn't know nothing. As I recall, it's... We tried to get out of it. We told him some boys come on there, but he knew better than that. Uh, the agent over there, while I was coming up, was Yelvington. Yeah. 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 But everybody I see that would be older than I, kind of, you know, reached my or your maturity at this time, was old man. He said, old man Yelvington. That's what we'd call it. He had a pretty uh, Where did boy. you all go to school? Ma'am? Where did you all go to school? Ma'am, we had eight grades there. I graduated <laughs> eighth grade there and went to Titusville through the 12th. Who was the name of your teacher? I started out with uh, a Mrs. Nash, and then a Mrs. Brijo, and then uh, Florence Brer, and a principal named uh, Bridgewater. And then we had a, a Ramage. You didn't J.D. Pepper? And Peppers, yeah. yeah. Ralph, Ralph's brother, he, he was he, he usually never got in any, any trouble, J.O. But well, one day he got some, in some trouble, and Peppers would take him in the office and whip him yeah. with a paddle or, or his belt. His belt. Pepper used his belt. And J.O. was smart. 
He waited till, till uh, Peppers got through whipping all those boys, about seven, eight of them. And when he got to Joe, he couldn't hardly swing that belt. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe got a weapon, but he didn't get a very big one. We had uh, uh, Eva Taylor, yeah. Truman Taylor's wife, as his first and second grade, and the superintendent Mays, her daughter, Mrs. I forget Lois what her first Mays. Lois Mays, for second, uh, she her could third, look and both fourth. ways at one time. <laughs> yeah, she could look both ways, and she caught Ralph cutting up. And uh oh. She's gonna go back there and and, and uh, put the paddle on his butt, and she uh, told Ralph to get up. And when Ralph got up, he took the paddle away from her and threw it out the window. <laughs> but anyway, we had uh, Florence Blair and and uh, Bridgewater in the upper grades. Ralph and I from Bridgewater, we were the soup kitchen. <laughs> We'd come over to a Duff store and get a whole piece of meat or a bone or something. Come Knee. back. <laughs> Knee bone. <laughs> <laughs> come back. We'd make soup. The, the uh, cloak rooms between the rooms you, uh, were joined through the cloak room. You could go from one room to the other through the cloak room and just had a door in there. You could buckle it off if you wanted to, but uh, it was usually we open. school there. There's probably 60 kids there. Now then, they got two schools out here and over 600 in each school. Yeah. And we went, but we went to high school. There was uh, four buses. There was Carl Ballard and his wife had one, and George Sharp had one, and Elton Barnes drove the other one. Mm -hmm. or Frank, who was it, Elton or Frank? Well, uh, anyway. Frank. Battle had two. This battle yeah. drove south and yeah, Carl right. drove north. Anyway, there was n hardly any of the teachers had cars. And there was two cars at that school when we was going there. One of them was Jack Brandon. He, his daddy was the manager of the Magnolia yeah. Theater. And Bernard Parrish, who was just passed away a couple of years ago, who was a brother of J.J. Parrish. And they were the only ones that had cars. Yeah. We were in the uh, seventh grade and uh, had old pot belly stove in there. Uh, rooms, the ceilings as high as this ceiling here. Had a pot belly stove in there for heat and the, the pipe went all the way up through the top. Florence Blair sent Ralph and I out to the woodshed to bring some wood in for the stove and stoke the stove. So we went out and got some wood and brought it back in and stoked it. We got every stick of, you couldn't have put a match in that stove when we got through. In about five, 10 minutes, it was red all the way to the <laughs> ceiling. They abandoned ship. We had to get out before the school caught on fire. Hey, it's cool. time to go. Yeah. No, almost. <laughs> One more thing. Um, uh, uh, P.W., what, what was Ralph's nickname and how did he get it? <laughs> and they, we called, we called him Skunk. And his daddy told me that the way Ralph, he said, I'll tell you how Ralph got that name. He's, and he almost showed me the spot where he got it. We ride, was riding horses out one day. He said, this is where Skunk got his name. He said, we was out here in the woods with, on a wagon. And it said there was a skunk went across the road in front of us. And I says, catch him, Ralph, catch him, Ralph. Ralph jumped off the, uh, the wagon and run after him, caught that skunk, and he skunk. <laughs> and that skunk queued all over him, and that's the way he got his name. Uh, he got another name. He now, got a now, Ralph, what's the real story? Well, when I was born, I, I had a haircut in two hours after I was born, <laughs> really. And my hair was so shaggy and white. The uh, granddaddy said he looked like an old uh, polecat's tail, and that's where I got the name. Ah, and uh, <laughs> then when, for years then, they, they, they called me old, old Bristles. Because yeah, my hair, it, it's pretty now, you know, but long then it wasn't so good. But uh, One more thing. P.W., you were telling me about um, when the, uh, in the old days, when the train used to come through on the spur over near the river, and uh, uh, how did they let you know when a freeze was coming? If, if there was a freeze coming, when those passenger trains or any train that run by during the day, the engineer oh, sure. would blow that whistle seven times. And you could hear that whistle in the mems. And that's how you knew. Uh, do you remember when the tent factory uh, was in town and made tents? No, but I've got pictures made of them. What? Made tents to cover the citrus trees oh, yeah. up to keep them from the freezes. What was that old man's name? I don't know. Oh, yeah, he wore a Spanish-American war hat. Oh, uh, Copen yeah. Coppola, Coppolo. Yeah, Max von Coppolo. He run that tent factory? 
I, he gave I us a Spanish American War veteran button. I don't know, probably swallowed it. But anyway, we just about prized that thing. Doodle Fresh was a negotiator and got me a button. Yeah. yeah. How about Mr. Uh, is it Tierweiler? Tierwiller? Tierwiller. Tierwiller. Yeah. And his goats? Yeah, and his goats. <laughs> okay. Mr. Tierwiller, he was an old Yankee man to come in here and he had a lot of grows. And he was, he was tight, cheap, and he didn't want to work his grows, so he bought a bunch of goats, fenced the place in, and the goats got to gnawing on the bark of the trees and hooking the trees and tearing up the trees, so he had to, you can't cut a goat's horn off because they'll bleed bad. Anyway, he cut the horns off and knocked the teeth out, and they all died from so because they couldn't <laughs> eat, they couldn't hook. And that's the truth. Yep. He also, Jake was a railroad man, he rode the railroad. They charged him a nickel to go from his Wiley Avenue to Titusville. And he said, damn, that's too much. Well, they wouldn't make any uh, reservations of any kind. So he told me, he says, you can't keep me from walking down the road, and I'll save my nickel. And that's what he done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he walked every day down the railroad. Uh, uh, one more thing. You you'd mentioned about uh, Indian Field. What was Indian Field? I can't tell you how to get get to it. You go to Turpentine Road and go south just as far as you can, and there was a high, not a rich knoll out there, and they planted a few orange trees and everything. Yeah. Old man Cooper had that, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Sam Norton, I think, was the start of it. Yeah. He, he, I, I think that other old man, old man, uh, I called his name a while ago. Whitmore. 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 Yeah, I, I, don't, think, I, don't he, I think he had the first, and then old man Sam and Norton. Got it. And old then man sold it to Cooper. Yeah. Old man Norton lived there on what we call Tomato Farm Road. Well, it's it's still Tomato Farm Road there now, but he lived there in a house on the south side. And he had what is it, an Overland? He no, drove that was old man Overland. Oh, great, great, great. Okay, yeah, that's old man Great. Okay, yeah. but he'd come into the it was Nolly's store where Sharp store is. He'd come up there with that old uh, Overland, Overland or something. Yeah. He'd rear back on that thing, pull on the steering whoa, wheel, just whoa. hollering and yelling, whoa, whoa, whoa. He ran right that tree. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was, he, he was a spendthrift also. Then my uncle was building a road through there that had an old Fordson tractor. So he, the mule died, and died right by, right by the well. So he told Walter Glenn, he said, Walter says, you can go down there and drag that mule off of this old tractor for old man great if you want to. So he did, he went down there and told him, he says, Mr. He says how much it gonna cost me? He says, a dollar. He says, hell no. He says, I'm not gonna pay you no dollar. So he let him go and he got right side underneath the mule and buried the mule right beside the pump. <laughs> and that, that's, that's the truth too now. <laughs> yeah. all, I guess all them people did that knew it but mm -hmm. me now, but the, the, he, he dug that dad bump thing where the mule would go down and Barrett put her on there, so he had a dollar, and, and they probably took two days. Well, who built that um, over store? Green uh, Brothers. Green Brothers. Brothers. Green Brothers. Yeah. yeah. Um, how about that, uh, Ralph? You were telling me about an old cemetery out off of 46. Yeah, it's on Tammy Drive, out off 46, going north on Tammy Drive. You go all the way to the dead end, and the cemetery is on the right. Back to the right. Yeah. And I have, uh, well, it's, I guess it'd be great aunts, two of them or three there, and George Sharp, he had two kids. Ralph, or, I thought that cemetery was there where, where Wilson had his home. Mm -mm. Oh. No. As you go right down Tammy Drive past old man, uh, oh, shoot. Anyway, you go all the way down to the corner. There's a corner down there, and it's, it was right in that little corner. So this is an old family cemetery mm -hmm. that was on yeah. an old yeah. family homestead. I'm pretty sure Ellis had a, a couple of kids buried there. Was that around that repatching place? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. North corner of it. Northeast corner. Yeah. Um, P.W., uh, your, uh, was it your grandfather's house or your father's house that was the big house on US-1 that was the restaurant? Uh, who's, whose house was that? It burned down a few years ago. That was a... Uh, that was my dad's house. He bought it from a man by the name of Coggins in 1917. Uh, 
few years after he was married, and I was, I was born in that house. And then when the when the road was four lane, uh, the road the northbound lane came right up to the porch, and so my mother built a big home back of where where Lillian is living now, and they, they, she sold that house for eight hundred dollars, and they moved it down to where it, where it burnt. A guy by the name of Tony Nastis bought it. He, he, he sold it to a couple of doctors or huh? something here. Tony, Tony sold it to a, a doctor and his wife or something. Mosier. Yeah, Mosier, yeah. yeah. And your granddad's house then is across the street from the old Kaiser place on US 1? Well, it's right north of where my sister lives. You know, yeah, that's, that's Harry and Selena Roberts' house. Yeah. That one. Well, that's not the original. They, the original house was built. You know where that big oak tree is right there at my sister's place? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where they came and homesteaded. But after they was there a few years, they found out it was, at, it was about 50 feet south of where the line was. So they had to t clean up some land on over farther and uh, build a, another home over there and tear that log gabbing down. As I understand, uh, they uh, grubbed uh, five acres and planted trees back in the 70s and discovered they had uh, cleared the road. You want to tell that story? I don't know nothing about that story that now. They, they discovered they uh, uh, cleared the wrong land, and so Harry had to go away and earn some more money and come back, and then they had to clear another five acres that was on their own land. I, I don't. No, that no. Did Lillian tell you that. Yeah, no, it was in your grandmother's uh, memoirs that oh, she had was? written. Yes. Uh huh. How come and, you haven't uh, got that straightened out? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about the uh, Dickens Inn, where the Dickens Inn is now, in Blackhawk Davis? Yeah, that was that was my mother's parents' home. Can you tell us a Black little Hawk. something about it? Well, they came here from Kentucky about 19, 12, or 13, and he was a big farmer in Kentucky, and he got tired of farming and he came to Florida and bought several acres of orange grove and my mother worked at uh, the Rexall drugstore in Titusville till she met my dad and they were married in a horse and buggy on uh, right across from Episcopal Church in Titusville in 19, about 1913 or 14. And I understand uh, old Doc Wilson, who had brought your uh, father into the world, uh, uh, also was the same gentleman that married them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Sammy, uh, how about uh, old Jake and Minnie Kaiser's house that's still on US-1? Can you tell us something about Jake and Minnie? Uh, very little, Ross. So he was my great uncle, and my mother's uncle on uh, my mother's, my grandmother's my mother's mother's side. And they came to Florida in uh, probably the middle teens. And uh, he uh, bought land there and uh, a distant cousin of his, Lonnie Kaiser, bought land right across from where P.W. was born, across the highway and built a house in there. And uh, I knew very little about him until, well, I wasn't old enough to know anything until probably in the late 20s. And uh, Jake died. Was in late twenties, wasn't it? P.W. I can't remember now. I remember he. Was, yeah. I'd say he's in the early thirties, somewhere along yeah. there. And his wife lived there and uh, raised a cousin of mine. And uh, that's about all I know about it. Uh, they they sold it to this fellow that has it now, and he's he's changed the looks of it. There's, he's put a porch on it and other things there, but. Uh, I can tell you something about Jake Kaiser. My daddy used to go over there every night. They met a rain or what, he'd go over well, there. They had some of the first uh, carbide lighting in Mims, didn't they? Yeah, and, and we did too. Yeah. And uh, when he died, I got smarted off. I said, well, I guess you'll stay home at night now. And boy, he <laughs> had him knock me off that porch. I never will forget it. <laughs> Backhand you was. Yeah, he said, <laughs> he said, I guess you'll stay home now. An old man, Lonnie Kaiser, at times it's hard. He had an old mule and a wagon, and whenever he come up the road, you clop it to clop. 
we'd all get up and look out. Of course, we'd get reprimanded, but we, it was worth a try. And that poor old man's wagon, says, it looked like it had the wheels pushed like that so it wouldn't fall out. And he had wire wrapped around the tire, and you could hear the poor old thing squack, squack, squack. And we'd get up. I don't know whether P.W. did or not, because his neighbor, but boy, the rest of us, we'd get up, watch that old man come by in that old ragged wagon. And he'd go down, had a straw hat. I guess the mule had probably bit the top out of it. But anyway, he'd go down and work and come back at noon and go back. He was an awful hard worker. Yeah, he was a hard worker. But we'd always like to watch old Mr. Lonnie come along with the old wagon. How about the, uh, Linder uh, or uh, Lot Price, uh, Sammy? Do you oh. any of you remember them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you say something about them? Not where did they do. used to live? <laughs> where, where did they used to live? He down bought where Union Carbide is. Just north of where Union Carbide is. Right down outside the railroad. Golly yeah. Avenue. Yeah, when he uh, bought that place, went up and uh, brought his wife down here. They had to wade knee deep of water to get into the front porch. Hmm. Then they, they moved to New Smyrna, and I, I guess he, di he died. Yeah, he I died up so. there. Yeah. yeah. But he, he, he left his tracks. I think everywhere he went, he had two or three wives and a few kids. <laughs> yeah. So he done pretty good for himself. Yeah. We, you, we wouldn't borrow money from the bank. My dad would never spend his own money. He says, you can't make money spending your own money. Use the other man's. If you can't make it, let him have it. <laughs> well, he'd go down there and he'd borrow, I remember he'd borrow money for a cent and a half. And boy, that would just break mama's heart because he'd spend his money, it wouldn't spend his money and borrow from old man lot price. I think, you know, I might still have some of the contracts here at the house, but I give the grandkid most of them in the last six months. But he, <laughs> That old man was a, a businessman, good old man, but boy, he... Man, he liked his bottle, yes, like the rest sir. of them. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what happened around here in, in, during the Depression? They were Not hard much. times. Very little. What, what, yeah. I, what did you do to sustain? We hunted these woods out for gophers and, and armadillos, anything we could eat. How do yeah. you cook a gopher? Yeah. You're talking out. about a gopher turtle. Highland turtle. Highland turtle. Yeah. Shell him out, cut his legs out. Very good. good. Put yes. some, we used to have gopher stews. Yep. Put uh, rice with it. Yeah. It's all right if you don't have to clean him. I don't. Yeah. If I clean him, I'm not hungry. How about that swamp cabbage? Oh yeah, oh, that's yeah, great. That's easy. That's yeah. Good. No, there was very little. We had cattle and all. We, did. I ain't gonna lie. We got along pretty good. P.W. did too. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> but the rest of them, boy, they, it, it was tough. Now they got. Uh, we. Me and Sam went to work for Macklemore one time. We got seven and a half cents an hour for 10 hours. You furnished your own file, you furnished your water. And your hoe. Yeah, yeah, and your hoe. And if you could catch the old tractor that he had rigged up, you could ride. If you didn't, you walked. You used to grub the... Ma'am? You used to grub, did you yeah, say? Yeah, you're darn right. Grub mounds, you'd make a six-foot mound. And if you was a good man and lucky, you'd get three of them a day. Good cent a mound. That's hard work. Grubbin's hard work. Yeah. What did they say about your father whenever you wanted something or you wanted something down in the grove, they'd drive by the corner down here, 20 miles an hour, whoever got on it, yeah. they worked for Charlie the day. Charlie Carlisle, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My dad, he was, he was blessed. He made a lot of money buying and selling fruit. And in 19 and uh, just before the banks failed, all of them, he and... Uh, J.J. Parrish and George Brockett went to Jacksonville and bought out the Indian River State Bank. And my dad was president of it. And it went broke in 32 or 33 when all the banks went broke. And that, he lost over a million dollars in that, in that crash and that was a pile of money in those days. We had property, we owned all that land out at where Gardendale is. Airport. We, we owned, uh, we owned uh, there where the, uh, that restaurant is, uh, there across from where the old funeral home used to be. We had a bank building in, in Old Galley. We had land in Orange Park. We, he had a, he had to uh, confiscate a, 
uh, outfit that had uh, was a contractor that had a bunch of mules and tractors and he brought the old mules up here and put them in the fence in this place up here in front of my place and and they all died and, uh, and but <laughs> we <laughs> but we we survived but he he, he liked to it we, he started drinking and then really liked to mess up. He was pretty good though. Now, my granddaddy had quite a bit of money in the bank, and they come told him, You better go get your money tomorrow, or you won't have any. And he did. He went down and they gave him his money. They were not supposed to be any preferential treatment, you know, and in a deal like that, but they, they, were, they were real good. He got his money. Well, about uh, 33, 34, we had the WPA came in, yeah. and quite a few people got a, got work from WPA. Yeah. We built uh, built a ball field up here behind the elementary school. They built one in Titusville and uh, I did a lot of uh, uh, build a Titusville marina. I worked for the cities and the county and the towns like that and uh, they kind of alternated the work. Uh, I'll just use an example here. Uh, a JC's daddy would work one week and they'd lay him off, and my daddy'd work a week, and they'd lay him off, and then they'd go back and get J.C.'s daddy so that uh, everybody had a little bit of money to buy. Most of us had a, a little garden and a cow or something like that, and the staples is about all we needed. You'd go out in the woods and get a hog or, or something like that and, uh, and uh, raise your vegetables and sugar and flour and cornmeal and things like that. So it was the main things that we bought, now we coffee. Now we've got a glorified WPA project over at Cape Kennedy. So. <laughs> it pays a lot more, though. Yeah, was, that's what my I said. daddy, When my daddy was working DW, uh, WPA here, I think it was about a uh, dollar a day or two dollars a day, something like that. Yeah. And I left over there at $25 an hour, so yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot better now. Yeah. Yeah. But, but my daddy, during those times, I'll tell this on PW, that, uh, my daddy worked for PW in the, in the orange groves, hoeing and spraying and everything else. Don't and uh, how to drive. well, you That'd better be. you better go back and get another lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, this was in the early '30s, and the house that my mother and dad lived in, where I was raised in, uh, it would belong to this outfit that had the tomato farm out there. And the burst came, and it came up for sale. Some way or other, my mother and dad got it through a government loan. I don't know what kind of loan it was back then, but anyway, uh, they had old man Wentworth as a lawyer. He was uh, closing the deal. My dad went to, uh, he was working for P.W.'s daddy. He went to uh, Mr. Roberts and says, uh, Phil, I've got to have a half a day off Friday to take care of some business. Phil says, poor people don't have business to take care of. They just got arrangements to make. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, is there anything else that any of you would like to add? Well, uh, uh, one thing. Okay. There used to be a man in Tysville, I forget his name, he was a real estate man, and he had a, I think it was a Model A Ford track truck, and he had a big picture of a bear on the back of it. Was his name Wentworth? I, I don't know. Anyway, the kids would always say, there goes a man with a bear behind him. <laughs> <laughs> he he finally went into the picture business, didn't he? Uh, I forget that old man's name. Yeah, Wentworth. Uh, Wentworth, he's a, he's a lawyer, lawyer, too. Wentworth was a lawyer. Yeah, that's what that <coughs> he was. He owned the St. Charles Hotel. Yeah. yeah. That guy I'm talking about, but I forget his name. Well, W.B. Kaiser Bill. married my wife and I oh. on Friday the 13th, which was a payday. <laughs> Had to wait and get paid before we could get married. <laughs> well, they baptized me in Sam. Rufus and about and seven or eight of us out there, and there was so much sin in there, Six Mile Creek didn't run for a week. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the reason Ralph. there's a curve in there now? <laughs> where, where, where does Six Mile Creek go? Into Little Salt, uh, Big Salt Lake. Okay. It goes to Jacksonville. Up, starts up north of Arantia Road. Does it? Yep. We came up, Ralph, they baptized Ralph, he came up like an otter, shook his head all over the preacher, the water just flying. <laughs> Where were you? Where were you baptized? Six Mile Creek. In Six yeah. Mile yeah. Creek. Yeah. Swimming hole. The swimming hole. That's what it Isn't does. That yeah. wonderful. Well, I really appreciate um, your visit with us this afternoon. It's been wonderful experience, and uh, thank you so very much, uh, each and every one of you.
The reason yeah. I have been so quiet is because it's incriminating. No, no. <laughs> there are senior adults here. <laughs> So I'm the youngest one of the group, so I'm, I'm very interested in what Are they're talking about. Are we going to see this? Eventually. Eventually. Uh, P, uh, go can... down the line. P.W., tell me how old you are. I'll be uh, 80 in July if the good Lord sends it. I'll be 80 in November. 67 in July. 39. <laughs> now <laughs> we well, know better, Sammy. I'll be 79 in August. Well, uh, the good Lord's blessed you all with good looks and good health and good women. I've had, I've had two serious heart attacks 30 years ago, and, and I never will forget it. When I was recovering from the first one, the nurse told me, she says, you're going to have five good years to live. And that was in 1970, and the Lord's <laughs> blessed me, and I'm still here. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Yeah.